Hi, welcome to the Sigma Path. In this episode, I want to talk about magnetic levitation. I was in the process of making some videos about phase lock loops, but in order to really understand phase lock loops, you need to understand feedback theory and control system theory to appreciate the complexity and the concepts that go into making a phase lock loop. So in the process, I thought we would do something a little bit simpler first, doing some magnetic levitation experiments, which takes advantage of feedback theory uh, in order to be able to accomplish the task. So I have put together probably the simplest possible magnetic levitation circuits that you can do and you still accomplish the task and I want to talk a little bit about uh, the idea at first and then show you the chips that I use, the circuits that I use and then we'll see what I've built. So let's talk about magnetic levitation in its simplest form. So what we're trying to accomplish is have an item float in midair, which essentially means canceling the force of gravity that's acting upon it. Now the force of gravity on any mass is F equal to mg, which is a linear function of mass. Now, if the item that I want to float uh, and, and kind of levitate is ferromagnetic, I can apply a magnetic field on it and try and pull it up in the opposite direction that the gravity is acting on it. If I can get the force Fm to be exactly equal to the force F equal mg, the net difference is zero and the, the object will therefore not move in any direction and will stay exactly where it is. Now that's pretty complicated to do. First of all, there's the diff added difficulty of the creating a magnetic field, but once you get past that, the force that is acting on the object that's ferromagnetic by a magnetic field is, a, is not a linear function of distance but is a, a function of 1 over the square of distance. So therefore, as the object gets closer to the source of the magnetic field, the, the strength of the force increases by the square. So therefore, it, it gets sucked right onto it. And you've seen that if you're playing with two magnets. I have two here in my hand. These are new diamond magnets. This is what I want to levitate. And here I have another one. And these guys, uh, once they get close together, then they, they snap onto each other really quickly because the magnetic field accelerates them really rapidly toward each other. So what you need to do is you need to first create a magnetic field that you can control. That's not so difficult because once you push current through a coil, here's that I have drawn a current source that's pushing current through this coil with a, with a center that's a ferromagnetic center in the middle. If I adjust the current I, I can adjust the magnetic field. So what I need to do is I need to somehow measure the distance between this object and the magnetic field that is being generated and measure that distance and use that distance in order to correct the amount of current that I need to apply. So this, this essentially forms a feedback loop, meaning that you measure something and you measure how much off your, how much error you have, and you use an error value to correct the magnetic field. For example, let's say the object gets really close to the magnet. The magnet, then we sense the distance, we measure that, we feed that back, and we reduce the strength of the magnetic field so the object can fall back down. And if it's falling back down too much, then we detect that it's too far from the magnet, and then we strengthen the magnetic field to bring the object back up. So this negative feedback system can be used in order to Keep, the ma keep this object, this, uh, let's say this uh, neodymium magnet, right here in the middle and not allow it to go down or to go up and hover it in a specific location by precisely matching these two forces. So the question is, well, how do we measure the distance between this um, uh, magnet and the magnetic field and the source of the magnetic field itself? So I need somehow to find out where this object is in free space. Well. There's several different ways that people have tried. Here I've taken a, uh, a screenshot of uh, some website that someone has attempted. This is one way to do it. And the, the way this person has done it, here's the magnet at the top. This is a, uh, a neodymium magnet that's in the shape of a sphere. The ones that I have are in the shape of small disks, but it's the same idea. Now what he's done is that he's placed a, a light source here with multiple LEDs, and he's placed some light detectors, some photo detectors on the left side. So if the ball moves too low, then it, the light can go through and it can detect that the ball has come down too far. And if the ball goes up too far, then you can see the light goes from underneath the ball and then you know that it's too close to the magnet. So by reading, the, by knowing when the, lo the light across this path is blocked or not blocked, you can actually know exact location of the ball in the middle and adjust the magnetic field to keep it hovering right there in the middle of this magnetic field. Now, this is a nice and elegant solution. The only problem is that 
you need something that goes across so you need a light source that the ball can actually block so you know its location so it's nice but I didn't want to do it this way I didn't want to use a light source because it building it is too complicated you have to put it on both sides of the magnet and so on so I said no let's do it in a slightly different way so the other way that people usually do is by using one of these guys this is a Hall effect sensor so the Hall effect sensor the Hall effect itself was discovered by Edwin Hall in uh, 1879 I think where he discovered that it is possible for current to be affected by a magnetic field in a conductor now normal this is a Hall effect sensor right here now these type of Hall effect sensors the modern ones use semiconductors you can actually have a semiconductor that takes advantage of the Hall effect and gives you uh, a measure of how strong the magnetic field is that is going through it so essentially the semiconductor inside that is affected by the Hall effect if you have magnetic field that goes right through the sensor so here's the sensor a magnetic field goes through it and comes out of the other side and as it as it goes through the sensor itself it, it has an impact on the semiconductor material and that is detected and it gives you an output voltage now there are multiple types of Hall effect sensors this particular one gives us uh, an analog voltage output that is proportional to the strength of the magnetic field now you can also buy them such that they only trip so they only give you a binary output either one or a zero if the magnetic field is stronger than a certain amount then the output would flip now I prefer these ones that gives you an analog voltage output because I want to build an analog circuit so what I can do is I can place this Hall effect sensor right here now what will that do for us well we have magnetic field that is generated by the magnet at the top and we have a magnetic field that is generated by the magnet that I'm trying to hover at the bottom these two magnetic fields interact together right there where the Hall effect sensor is and they actually add up together so if I were to measure the magnetic field here and since I know the magnetic field that's being generated from the magnet itself as this ball moves down or it moves up the total effect, the total magnetic field that passes through the Hall effect sensor becomes a direct function of the location of this magnet itself. So let me say it in a slightly different way. As the magnet moves further away, let's forget about that there is an electromagnet at the top. If I bring this magnet really close and then the, the strength of the magnetic field is very high and the Hall effect will tell us that hey the magnetic field is really strong therefore your magnet must be really close to the Hall effect, Hall effect sensor. If I bring the magnet further down then the magnetic field weakens going through the Hall effect sensor and the voltage drops now there is what the way I want to do it is I want to use two Hall effect sensors put one down here and put one up there and by measuring by subtracting the voltage that I read between the two ends of these I can then isolate only the effect of the magnet at the bottom you don't have to do it this way you can only use one and it will still work but I like this because it gives us directly only it only measures the location of the of the magnet that I'm trying to hover itself so let me say that again so if I have a Hall effect sensor at the top and I have a Hall effect sensor at the bottom and I take these two voltages and I subtract them and I get some voltage at the output now this Hall effect sensor here and this Hall effect sensor here both measure magnetic field the magnetic field that is going through this Hall effect sensor is, the is only the magnetic field of the magnet itself but the magnetic field that's going through the Hall effect sensor at the bottom is the magnetic field of this magnet at the top and of the object that I'm trying to hover so if I subtract them I only get the magnetic field and I only get a voltage that's proportional to the distance of the uh, magnet that's tr that I'm trying to hover so all I need to do is to place two of them and then subtract the voltages so I can only see the impact of the magnet that I'm trying to hover now what am I going to use for an electromagnet? magnet well I found this guy on Amazon uh, but it didn't look like this there used to be one of these here as well so it was actually a u-shaped electromagnet that I bought for about ten dollars or so so you can apply current in here and you'll get a magnetic field here and and then you, there was another one there which you could do the same thing now I went ahead and I cut this with great difficulty uh, and I separated it because I couldn't pull this out so I'm, I'm, the other one is actually used in the setup so that's why I wanted to show you this one separately so what I can do is I can place my Hall effect sensor at the bottom here and I can since the other one doesn't have this I'll cut this up and I'll put another Hall effect sensor at the top here and I can subtract the output from the two that way depending on the location 
of this magnet at the bottom, I am only reading the location of the magnet that I want to hover. So that solves part of our problem because that tells us that now we can create a voltage that is directly proportional to the location of the magnet that we want to hover and levitate. Therefore, we can use that information. This You can use this voltage somehow to control uh, this total amount of current that goes through uh, the magnet that creates the magnetic field. So the IC that I want to use has to take the output voltage and control the current that goes through the inductor itself. So I was looking around and I came across this particular uh, IC to use for this purpose. Now, before I talk about the IC itself, there is there is many ways of uh, taking the signal that comes from the Hall effect sensor and controlling the strength in the magnetic field. Some people just directly digitize the output that comes from the Hall effect sensor and use a microcontroller, and they program the microcontroller with their feedback parameters, and then they can control uh, the current inside the inductor for their purposes. That would be a totally digital way of doing it. That, that requires you to write a software and use a microcontroller. So I didn't want to do it that way. So I wanted to do something that requires us to play with the actual components themselves. Now the exact opposite of that is using entirely analog means. Meaning that building an analog amplifier and building an analog difference amplifier and taking the error, error voltage and amplifying and then passing it through the proper control system circuitry and then controlling the current that goes through the inductor. That would be the other extreme. What I wanted to do is somewhere in the middle. I wanted to still use pulse width modulation to control the current that goes through the inductor. So I wanted to essentially turn this current I on and off really quickly as opposed to having an analog voltage that controls it. Now I looked around the web and I came across this particular IC. This is the KA7500C from Fairchild Semiconductors. It's an IC intended for use in DC-DC converters and it is essentially a PWM controller. It has a PWM controller built into it and it has error amplifiers built into it, which is perfect because that's exactly what we want. We want an error amplifier that controls the PWM, pulse width modulation, that controls the current through our inductor that adjusts the magnetic field. So let's take a look and see what is inside this IC. So here's the block diagram. And we can take a look and see what it does. So there's a lot of stuff in this IC that we don't really need, but they're there because they're very useful when you're building a DC-DC converter. For example, it has a band gap reference that you can use uh, as a, a kind of a temperature insensitive reference for your DC-DC converter. We don't really need that, but anyhow, that's why these, these things are there because it's intended for DC-DC converters. But for us, Let's think about what is happening inside this IC. So it has an oscillator. So you can give it a resistor and a capacitor in order to set the RC time constant of the oscillator and get the oscillation frequency that you're looking for. That would be the PWM frequency that will come out of the IC. I'm using about two kilohertz, but it can be used all the way up to 300 kilohertz. Once you put a capacitor here, it actually begins to create a ramp oscillation for you like this and so on. So this ramp like so let me put it here. This ramp then is fed directly into the PWM comparator. Now one side of the PWM comparator is the ramp voltage, you can see as it goes up like that. And the other side of the PWM comparator is the output of the error amplifiers themselves. So essentially what it means is that if my error is all the way positive, meaning that if my error amplifier says the error is so large that V plus is way higher than V minus, actually it doesn't have to be very much because the gain is very high in open loop, but anyhow, if the V plus is, is higher than V minus, then the output will become high and the PWN, then the comparator will always give you a one. So you'll get a 100% duty cycle. If the output is low, then the PWM will always, the comparator will always give you zero and the output will always be zero. So that's the two extremes of a 100% duty cycle and 0% duty cycle. And anything in the middle will give you a duty cycle at the output that is proportional to the error function that is fed inside it. Now remember, we are looking at this in open loop. In reality, so let's follow this a little bit further. So let's forget about this guy. You don't have to worry about it. That is for dead time control and so on that you can disable and anyhow, we don't have to worry about this, forget about this for a second. So this comparator goes through here, then then goes to the output, which then goes through this AND gate, which directly controls the base voltage on the collector of the output. So if I take the collector, for example, here, and I connect the collector to VDD, 
and I take the emitter and I connect it to ground and I look at this output voltage, then what I end up with is a pulse like that, where the, the duty cycle of this is directly proportional to the error that is generated by the error amplifier inside, once everything is in a feedback loop. So you can see that if I were to give my error function somehow, let's talk about that later, if I give my error function to this amplifier and I take the output of this amplifier and bring it back, which somehow then controls my error uh, voltage that comes out, I can adjust the PWM duty cycle in order to get give me the exact uh, voltage that I want at the output. So that seems a little bit confusing. So let's take a look at their application circuit. It may become a little bit more clear. So here's a typical application where, where an IC like this can be used. So they're using it in a um, pulse with modulated step down converter. It says at the bottom right here. So what they're doing is that they want to create 5 volts at the output, but they're giving it anywhere from 10 to 40 volts. This is the main switching output transistor, and this is the main uh, uh, inductor that are, they're using at the output. So if I were to turn this switch on and off with a PWM, I can adjust the voltage that appears at the output because I have a, an inductor here and a capacitor here. The combination of the buck converter gives me the output voltage that I want. So if you look at it, the output voltage is sampled by pin 1, which is this guy, one of the pins of the error amplifier. And pin 2 is taken from the reference voltage. So therefore, the reference voltage directly, so you, you, you want to achieve the reference voltage, you can feed it to the pin 2. And then the output of the PWM controls the transistor at the output, which then controls the current in the inductor, which then controls the output voltage. So that's the, feed, the kind of feedback circuitry that I'm talking about. So we can take advantage of that. We can build a circuit that's very similar to this. And instead of this inductor here, we will have our electromagnet. And, and instead of this uh, V reference here, we will just set our voltage that we want to achieve, which would correspond to a specific distance of the magnet uh, to the electromagnet or to the Hall effect sensor. So, for example, here's my Hall effect sensor here, and here's my magnet. And if I measure, I know that, okay, if my magnet is this far away, then my Hall effect sensor is giving me, I don't know, on top of my head, 4 volts, for example. So I can set my reference to be 4 volts, because if the magnet is closer, the voltage will be smaller than 4 volts, and if it's further, it will be higher than 4 volts. So exactly 4 volts means keeping the magnet right here, and at the top, I'll have the magnetic field from the coil acting on it. So, let's see what circuit I've come up with. Well, I hope you haven't run away yet. I know I haven't shown you any hardware, and that's the part that's more fun to watch, but let's go over this last circuit before we talk about the actual implementation. So here's the final circuit that I have come up with in order to do magnetic levitation. You can see it's really, really simple. Here's the uh, KA7500C uh, IC that I was talking about. So here's my first Hall effect sensor, here's my second Hall effect sensor, and here's my inductor. So this Hall effect sensor sits on top of my electromagnet. This Hall effect sensor sits at the bottom of the electromagnet. So now at the same time, I have my magnet that will be hovering below the Hall effect sensor itself. So I take the voltage difference between the two Hall effect sensors. Remember why we're doing that? We're doing that because that will be the difference between the magnetic field from the top and the bottom of the electromagnet. I take that voltage, I pass it through this op amp, which is a really, really simple circuit. And if you go through the derivations, if all the resistors are equal, in which case they are all equal in this, then the output voltage, VFB, is just the difference between these two voltages. So I'm directly subtracting the voltage that I'm getting from the two Hall effect sensors, and that's my feedback voltage. This feedback voltage is proportional to the position of the magnet with respect to the edge of the electromagnet. So as I move this, if I can find my, uh, so if I, have a, if I have this configuration, as I come closer to this and as I go further from it, that voltage there is directly proportional to the distance between of this magnet to the electromagnet. So that's my feedback voltage. Now, in order for me to adjust the distance that I want to achieve, I have to give the other terminal some reference voltage. So I'm using a potentiometer to give it the reference voltage that I want. So once this voltage and this voltage are exactly the same, then my electromagnet has accomplished magnetic levitation and the magnet is staying where it's supposed to be. All the other part of the circuitry is very easy. So the output of the PWM, I'm taking it from the emitters and I'm connecting it directly to 
a high voltage MOSFET, which then turns the electromagnet on and off really quickly. I have a resistor at the top to limit the current in the electromagnet because if I put all the current through the electromagnet, it, act, it can actually overwhelm the Hall effect sensor. It saturates the Hall effect sensor because these, these, the ones that I bought are too sensitive. I also have a diode that's in reverse polarity directly across the magnet. Now, the reason I do that is, is important to understand why we're doing that. Remember that I'm turning the current on and off in the magnet. So I have a PWM like so, current applied to the magnet. Every time I turn the magnet off, the voltage across the inductor becomes L times DI over DT. DI over DT is the rate of change of the current. Since I'm turning the current off immediately, then the voltage is negative here. So that now the voltage becomes very large, and a very large voltage will appear across this inductor, which can damage the transistor. By putting the diode in reverse bias across it, I absorb that voltage, I absorb that current through the diode, as opposed to uh, subjecting the transistor to it. Now, if you go back to my, one of my earlier videos when I did the ignition coil, when I created something like a Tesla coil, I took advantage of this and I did not put the diode there in order to create a really high voltage and sparks. Anyway, you can go back and watch that and see what happens. So, so if, essentially this is the, the whole circuit that I want to build and I have built it. So let's go over and take a look at it. Okay, so let's take a closer look here. So let's see what I have. So here's the circuit that I built, which is essentially the circuit that we saw uh, at the schematic that I showed you. Here is our PWMIC in the middle. Here's the potentiometer that sets the reference voltage. So here we go. So here's the potentiometer that sets our reference voltage, and this is the IC right here. There is the, uh, there is the capacitor and the resistor that I used as the time constant in order to give this guy the proper frequency of operation. Here's my difference op amp. You can see it has one, two, three, and this is four. These are in parallel. It has four resistors in there in total. And that is this circuit right here. Oops, that's this circuit right here. I also have my um, MOSFET device right here, which is connected to a copper heatsink because this is the guy that puts all the current at the output of the electromagnet. And here's my huge five ohm resistor uh, which has, uh, which is uh, where the whole current for the electromagnet also passes through it. So it has to be fairly large in order to dissipate the power. So this is all the circuit that you need in order to accomplish this. The rest of the capacitors are just decoupling capacitors. So I'm also looking at a few of the voltages so we can take a look and see what happens to them. This is the PWM output of the IC, this voltage right here. That would be this voltage right here. I'm also looking at the feedback voltage and the voltage that I'm setting with the potentiometer. So I'm also looking at the feedback voltage and right here the voltage that I'm setting with the potentiometer. So the oscilloscope is connected to here, here, and here. These are the, the three most important places to look because this is the feedback voltage that we want to make equal. If everything is working, these two have to become equal. And this guy is the PWM that is driving the electromagnet. And here's the electromagnet itself. As you can see, it looks just like the other one, except that I've cut the, 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 uh, the steel that goes, the steel tubing that goes right through. Uh, this is one of the inputs, this is the other inputs, they're not connected right now. This is the wire for the Hall effect sensor at the top, right here. Right underneath here, these are the three, uh, three terminals, my Hall effect sensor is sitting right underneath here. There's also another Hall effect sensor at the bottom, right there. And these are the, the wires that come out of it for the other Hall effect sensor. So both of these Hall effect sensors go directly to the uh, board, go directly to the board, and those will be these two guys going directly into the op amp. So you can see they go into these two resistors, which are these two resistors. So everything looks good. Now a couple of hints for you. Uh, make sure you put something on top of the Hall effect sensor, something soft like this uh, rubber band here, because during your experiments, many times you're going to lose the magnet and it's going to slam directly onto uh, the electromagnet itself and it can crush and shatter your Hall effect sensor and those are expensive They're a couple of dollars each so make sure you put something soft and squishy on top of it to protect your Hall effect sensor because surely they will slam onto the magnet as you're trying to fi figure things out so let's go ahead and turn it on and uh, see what happens so in order to provide it with power I'm gonna run the whole thing from 10 volts 
uh, 10 volt is the maximum voltage the Hall effect sensor can receive. So I'm running everything from a single power supply. So the whole system actually re requires really only one power supply. So let me put this side down. There we go. I can take a look at a couple of things. So what I've done right now is I haven't connected the electromagnet yet. It's, it's not connected to anything. It's just sitting freely. So what I want to show you is measuring the voltage that comes out of the Hall effect sensor when there is no feedback connected. So you can see it on the oscilloscope. So these guys are the two voltages. So I'm going to enable the power supply. There it is. So let's see what we are looking at. So the yellow Yes, that's right. So the, so the yellow line, which is channel 1 of the oscilloscope, is the feedback voltage that's coming back from, from here. That's this voltage. The blue line here is the reference voltage that I want to achieve. Right now, the electromagnet is not connected. So you can see the yellow line and the blue line are not equal to each other. Now, as a result of that, this guy at the top, is the PWM output. You can see the PWM is almost 100% on. So it's on here and off for a very short time and on again and off for a very short time. This is because there is no magnetic field. So the system thinks that the magnet is not in the right location. So therefore it's maximizing the PWM in order to bring the magnet close. So since remember I, I, have, I don't have the electromagnet connected. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the magnet close and far from the electromagnet so you can see what happens to the voltage okay so take a look I'm, all I'm doing is this as I bring it closer you can see the yellow line goes goes down which means it's reaching the point where it's supposed to be and as soon as it crosses the blue one the PWM stops why because now the magnet is too close so therefore the system tries to stop the magnet from having any current in it so if I go above 100% roughly 100% PWM below 0% PWM. Somewhere right around the border, you will, well, which I cannot do with my hand because it's such a fine adjustment, you will be able to get the correct PWM ratio in order to keep the magnet floating perfectly. But right now, my electromagnet is not turned on. But you can see the system works. This is right now an open loop. There is no feedback. 100%. 0%. So this is exactly what we want to accomplish, except we want these two lines to be right on top of each other like this. So let's connect the electromagnet and try this experiment again. Okay, so right now I connected the electromagnet. Here it is. You can see I've connected the, the two cables electric to the electromagnet. And so the magnet is now on 100%. It's, it's, it's using as much current as it can because there is nothing hovering here. There's no magnet here. So therefore it thinks that the magnet is too far away. So it's applying as much magnetic field as it can in order to bring the magnet back up. If you look at the power consumption, right now it's sitting at 14.2 watts, which is the highest because I'm putting 1.4 amps through the magnet itself. And if you look at the output voltage, it's still where it used to be, roughly. It's a little bit lower than before. And this is the advantage of this using two Hall effects because, there, because the total mag magnetic field and the two sides are canceled. So you can only still see uh, the, the difference between them. If I were to bring a magnet closer, you can see I, I, can, I can again do the same thing. You can see. But now you can see that there is a little bit of a difference. So now let's look at the, let's look at the magnet itself for the magic moment. Take it out of here. Here we go. And voila, there it is. You can see it really is almost like magic. You can see there really is hovering. No problem at all. Now if I were to look at the scope, you can see that the two lines are on average exactly on top of each other. The, the little pulses and the noise that you see around it is because the magnetic field, the pulse width modulation is rapidly changing. So if I take a single shot, you can see how the pulse width modulation is quickly 
active here for so there's nothing and then immediately turns on and then there is some uh, some activity and then it turns off and then in, off again for a while and then some quick activity and so on and so I don't want to get into too much detail of why it looks exactly like that it's a it's not that simple to explain I have to think about it a little bit more carefully but what is important to understand is that the system is continuously adjusting the pulse width modulation and the total current that is supposed to flow through the inductor in order to create this levitation. If you look, the yellow and the blue line are perfectly on top of each other because that's what I needed to accomplish in order to have the magnet at exactly the right location. You can see it's still hovering. Now, there are some other things I can do. If you remember, this voltage is proportional to distance and this voltage is the voltage that I want to accomplish. So if I were to change this voltage, I can actually change the distance of the magnet with respect to the electromagnet. So let's try that out. There we go, so I have a potentiometer. I can turn the potentiometer. I'm trying to do too many things with one hand, but here we go. I can raise it. I can lower it. You see? If I raise it too much, it's going higher and higher. Oh, there it is. Now I got stuck. Now, why does that happen? Well, I'll tell you in a second. There is a problem with this system. And the problem with this system is that our electromagnet can only attract, it can never repel because I always put current in the electromagnet in one direction but the core but the core of this electromagnet is made of steel is ferromagnetic, is iron so even if the magnet is completely turned off like I just did this magnet still sticks to this so if the magnet is too close such that the magnetic the, the effect of the iron in the center is too strong and this magnet is being attracted to the center with or without the magnetic field generated by this, there is nothing we can do about it. Once the distance is close enough, such that the iron core absorbs this magnet toward it, then there is no way for the magnet to stop this from getting closer and it's ultimately getting a stick, sticking to it. So what we would need to do is we would need to be able to reverse the current in the electromagnet to be able to push the magnet away if it gets too close. Now we can't do that with a single transistor at the output we would need to we cannot do it with only one transistor here we also would need a transistor up there in order to have a positive and a negative power supply so that we can have positive and negative current now if you were to do that then you would be able to bring this magnet really really close and really really far because when it's very really far away you want to absorb it when it's really really close you want to push it because it's getting attracted to the iron core in the middle of the magnet so overall, it's not so bad for just a few components to be able to achieve magnetic levitation so easily. Now, I, there is a lot of stuff that I, of course, haven't talked about. You could do some really fancy things. You could build a control system that has a particular response, which then is insensitive to different types of disturbances. Right now, the system is accepting is, has no disturbances in it at all. If I apply a small disturbance, for example, like this, you can see it completely loses and it falls down. If I were to put it back, let me give it a bit of a wobble. You can see how it's wobbling. So depending on the type of control system that you implement, you can build a, a, a an overall system that, has, that is insensitive to a certain type of disturbances. You can see right now it has a minor oscillation. This oscillation will continue to build up and eventually the magnet may fall down. Now the reason this is happening right now is because I, I'm really, really pushing the, the magnet into having as much distance as possible to maximize this distance between the electromagnet and the magnet. So it's right at the edge of being unstable. I ran it before for about a few hours while I was doing some other things and I came back and it was still hovering. So it is stable, it's a stable system right now, but it could be, it could be improved significantly and be able to withstand disturbances from outside. I could also do what I was saying before and be able to have the, uh, the current reverse so I can actually push the magnet down as well as absorb it. That way you can bring it really, really close to uh, the electromagnet itself and still have it hover 
completely. You can also have another one at the bottom, then you can do even fancier stuff. And people have accomplished this and done this before, but I wanted to show you a really, really simple way of doing that. Now, I strongly recommend that you go and build this circuit for yourself because it's so easy and it's something, it's a great thing to show your friends uh, because uh, it just looks like magic, even though once you understand what's happening, I think that's where the most of the reward is to know why and how exactly it works. So go ahead and build it. I'll post the schematic on the internet so you can download it and take a look at it. And of course, you can have the video as a reference. And uh, if you do this yourself and if you build something like this yourself, please post it in the comment section on my website so other people can see it. A lot of people have done this before and, uh, and I'm going to disassemble mine to get ready for another video for later on. But it is a great little experiment and I'll also post the link for uh, where to buy this electromagnet uh, from Amazon if you like. I mean, it doesn't benefit me in any way. I don't get any benefit from that. But it's in case you want to buy something like that for yourself. So. And thanks for uh, subscribing to my channel. It's, we're almost at 5,000 people. I know it doesn't sound like much, but for such an esoteric topic, uh, it's quite amazing to see so many people and so much positive feedback. This is the reason why I do this. So I appreciate if you leave a comment and you subscribe and you let me know that you enjoy the videos. That would be a good reward for me. So until next time, have fun.